Welcome to the Haley Rowe Show. I'm a feel-good habits coach dedicated to helping you reach new levels of health, happiness, and high performance. Please visit www.haleyrowe.com for show notes. Let's get to it. Hey, everybody. I'm so excited about today's episode, and this interview with Danny Thompson was so good that I had to split up the episode into two. So today, you're getting the first part of the interview, and next week, the second part of the interview will come out. So be sure to subscribe on iTunes to get updates automatically. And remember to implement what you hear today on the episode. One more super exciting announcement before we get started with the interview. I have released my ebook. Woo! It's called Youth Proof, Six Weeks to a Healthier, Glowing You. And it goes over how to customize your skincare protocol, nutrition, supplements, and exercise to be geared towards longevity, preventing premature aging, protecting your gut health, and getting rid of some of the nasty toxins that hide in our products, in our supplements, in our nutrition, etc. So be sure to check it out at HaleyRowe.com slash product slash youth hyphen proof. And we're going to even have a VIP Facebook group for people who order the ebook and we could keep each other accountable and get the program customized to fit your needs, your budget, etc. We're going to make it work for you. So be sure to check it out. I'm so excited about it. And now let's get to the interview. I am here with Danny Thompson, and he is a synergistic performance coach, a certified bulletproof human potential coach, certified nutrition coach, personal trainer, performance specialist with USA Weightlifting, and the founder of YouCan2Fit.com. So tell me, how did you get all of these certifications? What's uh, What got you into fitness in the first place? Yeah, so uh, really starting out, I always had an athletics background. So I played football all the way through college. And once school finished, um, I had the regular corporate job. And pretty soon after that, maybe a year in, I realized it wasn't for me. And over the time, I kind of just started out as an intern, actually, at a sports performance facility here in South Florida. And from there, I kind of just built my way up and got more certifications along the way. And it's funny, as I think about the growth of it, you know, it started out with just fitness because, you know, that's what I knew and that's what I loved. And as I worked more on myself and worked with my clients, I really realized that the fitness aspect was, you know, it was important but it's probably the most overrated aspect of a a healthy lifestyle. So along the way, I picked up nutrition. And then from there, this past year, got into the uh, human potential side of things with Bulletproof. And that really brought it around to that 360 approach that I've been looking for. Yeah, definitely. I think in a way, fitness is kind of like the gateway into a healthier lifestyle. It's something that people can you know, get attached to, start seeing the results, and then maybe they get more interested in the nutrition piece and the whole lifestyle approach. So with the Bulletproof Human Potential Coach Training, tell me how that dives a little deeper as far as lifestyle goes. Yeah, for sure. So I would say the biggest thing um, that I learned from it is just really starting with like a state of presence, right? And kind of living in the moment more and really just creating more self-awareness, not only around, you know, myself and my habits and what I want, but why it is that I move in a certain way. And now that I look at my clients and we kind of go into their goals and everything that they're doing, um, instead of focusing on the what or, you know, whatever that may be, whether it be losing weight, putting on muscle, it's more so trying to build more awareness on around why that's important for them. And you, my friend, did not grow up all healthy and knowledgeable about fitness and nutrition, right? You grew up and had some stomach issues. Um, You said that on your website, you were overweight. Um, Tell me more about that whole thing and how you grew up versus how you live now. Yeah, yeah, it was funny um, coming up and not a lot of people know about this because they only know about, you know, how I am now. But when I was young, you know, my mom's single parent raising two boys. Um, she was working full time as a teacher, but then was also battling her own health problems. So she didn't really have the time or the energy to really 
cook us, you know, good quality home cooked meals. So, you know, my brother and I were always eating just, you know, bagel bites and pop tarts and cereal and all these processed foods and things like that. And that was literally every day, whether it was that, you know, fast food, pizza, Chinese, that was what I probably grew up on the first 11, 12 years of my life. Definitely a complete 180 for totally, what I Totally, me now. too. I grew up eating all of those, all of the above. <laughs> and occasionally I eat a little bit of Chinese food for pizza, sure. but that's, it's very uncommon. And every time I do, I'm like, ick, I hate that. I hate that I used to live like that. Anyways, when it comes to nutrition and what to eat, you started with fitness. So how did you start to implement nutrition and how did you start to stick to it? Yeah, so it's a funny story. I was, when I was probably like end of 2013, when I was just getting into my, my fitness career, I happened to be giving one of my buddies his training program, and one of his really good friends was giving him his nutrition program, and I was sitting there listening to everything he was going to eat, and at the time in 2013, my idea, my idea of like a, a healthy diet was, you know, brown rice, chicken breast, you know, tilapia lean meats, dry vegetables. And I'm hearing this, this meal plan that he's going to give my buddy. And he's talking about eating, you know, grass fed beef and eggs with the egg yolk. And, you know, he even at the time was talking about full full fat dairy and all these different things. And, you know, at the time I want to just like interrupt him and be like, yo, like, why are you going to give him all those things? Like, how is he going to lose weight? It's going to make me look bad as a trainer. And, you're right. So I waited a little bit, waited for my, my boy to kind of walk away for a second. And, you know, I asked my, or the guy, Mark, who is one of my best friends now, I asked him, I say, you know, he's going to eat all of those things and lose weight. And he's like, yeah, absolutely. And I was like, okay, hypothetically speaking, saying if I wanted to do the same approach, would I eat all those foods, but just less? And he's like, no, you'd eat more. You're bigger than he is. And I was like, I was literally dumb. I'm like, I'm not believing this. It doesn't make any sense. It's completely against everything I saw at the time, which was, you know, based off of like, you know, muscle and fitness and bodybuilding.com and, you know, stuff you might see from like a GNC or something. So at the time, this was maybe two years after I had graduated from college and I played defensive line in football. So I was like 285 pounds. I was a big guy. And by doing like this more, you know, what I call like politically correct diet, you know, at the time with just the chicken breast and the dry vegetables, you know, I might have lost like 15, 20 pounds. I was probably like 260 at the time. And, you know, I had hit a plateau. So it was funny that I actually got to hear um, my buddy Mark talk about these things. And he basically gave me a bunch of resources to look into. And he's like, hey, if you want to, you know, if you look at these resources, you like what you see, like we'll work together and I'll make a meal plan for you. And where he sent me to was the work of Dr. Weston A. Price. Are you familiar with him? I have heard of him, yes. But I think a lot of people probably, maybe not. Okay. So so Dr. Weston A. Price, he was a, a dentist um, back in the time of like the Industrial Revolution, where a lot of industrialized foods and processed foods were starting to come to the forefront. And what he noticed was almost majority of his clients all had um, some type of like tooth decay or some type of cavities. And he also noticed that these people also were super unhealthy, you know, obesity, heart disease, things of that nature. And his, his patients would ask him like, Hey, what, what could I do to be healthier? And he didn't really have an answer for him. These type of questions led him on this long expedition pretty much where he went and he looked at all these indigenous cultures all around the world where, you know, no roads have really led into and there was no real Western food culture had really hit those communities. And what he found was all these cultures, no matter where he was, whether it's a tropical climate, an Arctic climate, all around the world, they all had perfectly straight, full mouths of like wide jaw bones, like their teeth structure was perfect. They were slimy and stuff because they weren't brushing their teeth and things like that. But just in terms of the structure was just amazing. And then he noticed, I forget the exact number, but something ridiculous, like one out of like 50 mouths that he would examine would have a cavity, which was like astonishing to him. And pretty much what he saw with this, these diets is that all these cultures followed their, you know, traditional diets and all of them included some type of um, animal organ meat, 
you know, no processed foods. Um, everything was pretty much just from the land. It was a longitudinal study pretty much where he saw that the next generation of people, once these um, roads started leading in and they started getting more of the Western type of uh, processed foods, that second generation of kids started having a lot of crowding all through their mouths, a lot more cavities, and then things like, you know, heart disease and things like that started to come up where it was non-existent before. So kind of just looking at this research, it pretty much shifted me to more of a, at the time, like an ancestral diet. So just finding the best quality meat I could, um, you know, saturated fats, um, as many vegetables as possible, but like the grass fed butter, the egg yolks, like things I was completely neglecting before. And also, mind you, at the time when I was doing the other stuff, it was just after college. So on the weekends, I was going out still partying at night, doing a bunch of drinking, which is, you know, cool in moderation. But, you know, when I look back, I was going real hard at that and then, you know, eating some Denny's at night. So it probably wasn't the uh, the ideal way to do it. But once I dove into this diet that he recommended, man, not only did I end up losing like 30 pounds in probably the span of like four months, but more so than that, like I got so much more clarity, so much more energy. And I'm just like, damn, what else can I do to kind of kind of enhance this feeling that I'm that I'm going through now, really living life on a whole new level. Totally. And and this was called, would you call this the Weston A. Price diet? What would you call this? Yeah, so this is would be coined the, uh, the Weston A. Price diet. Okay. Now, what about the situation here? People saying, well, brown rice and chicken, those are whole clean foods. What's What's the issue with those? Yeah, I think what's happening a lot of times is people aren't focusing on the quality of the food and they're just thinking about the food itself. So there's kind of like this whole narrative out there that we came up with that you know, you should only be focusing on like the macronutrients, like your protein has to be super lean and you got to minimize your fat. Where if you really look at chicken, it's not, doesn't have as many micronutrients, so vitamins, minerals, things of that nature as say, you know, grass fed ground beef or wild caught fish would I think because of that being the norm and that being a big industry, you know, I think money always plays a part in things like that. And that's kind of why those things got popular. And then the whole thought with, say, like brown rice, you know, people think that they're supposed to have the slower, um, you know, digesting carbohydrates that doesn't cause like a big, quick insulin spike and things like that from all the sugar. But, you know, if you really look at a lot of brown rice, the research shows isn't very healthy with like the high amounts of whether it's phytic acid or you, you see a lot of different um like arsenic or different contaminants, depending on where it came from. So I think it's just more so just the narrative that kind of just was created over time. And people kind of just go with whatever they hear rather than maybe researching on their own. I totally agree. And with the chicken, that too has a lot of contaminants, a lot of metal, like arsenic. Um, they found high levels and it's always loaded with antibiotics or growth hormone unless you're getting really clean pasture raised chicken but even that's hard to find and and what about saturated fat why should we not be freaked out about that when you said you ate whole eggs and things like that i think with saturated fats is when you just look at the human body you know every cell that we have is type of lipid layer right and by lipid layer it means some type of fat layer that pretty much protects our cells from things coming in that aren't supposed to come in and things going out that aren't supposed to go out and then when you think about just, you know, it's like mitochondrial health is like the biggest rage, like in our circles right now. The, the mitochondria, which is like, you know, pretty much just the powerhouses of all of our cells that give us all of our energy and our vitality, you know, saturated fats play a huge role in the health of the mitochondria. And, you know, this is something I'm learning a lot more about now. But now that I look back to a few years ago when I first started eating that way, it makes sense to why I had way more energy and, you know, my mood was a lot better because now I'm feeding my brain the things that it needed, which are those saturated fats. Right. Cool. Okay. So let's shift gears a little bit into fitness. You had some rough points on your journey. You said you were overweight. Um, you said that you were bullied when you were younger in middle school. So tell me, was there a defining moment when you realized, like, I have to start changing? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, 
And it wasn't so much that I got bullied. It was more so that I, I was bullying other people. Oh, because <laughs> you're yeah. in a bad mood. Yeah, exactly. Right, right. Man, the defining moment for me really was, it's hard to say because I was always so active through sports and then just naturally through the position I played for football, I had to be bigger. But once football was done, uh, it was like 2011, like my first goal was like, all right, you know what? I want to get a six pack. That That's all I cared about. Like, yeah, let me get super lean, super aesthetic. I'm going to get all the chicks now. That was my mindset. And it was funny just as I was kind of going through that pattern, you know, I kind of realized that the physical wasn't really all that important. It was more so like my mindset and, and why I was doing it. So I think once like the weight started coming off as like a good byproduct of like, you know, the exercise and the nutrition, even more than that, it was like the relationship with myself kind of just changed. And I realized, okay, let me start to work out because, you know, I like the way I feel and I like the way I look rather than letting it come from like a negative spot of almost like hate, like not being good enough. Definitely. And when you said, oh, I just wanted to get a six pack, I think pretty much everybody wants to get a six pack. So can you right. just share with us, is that even possible for everybody? And what would be a few tips when it comes to getting abs? Yeah, I mean, that's the big, <laughs> the big thing. Uh, looking back, it's like, you know, we all just want to look better naked for the most part, like, unless it's like a sports performance thing, or we're training for some type of you know triathlon, marathon, whatever it may be. We all just want to look better naked. And when it comes to getting a six pack, you know, you kind of hear the cliche now. It's like, you know, abs are, you know, 80% made in the kitchen, 20% in the gym. And, you know, in most cliches comes a little bit of truth. But I think the diet is super important. It doesn't matter how many crunches somebody's trying to do or if they're, they're planking for hours a week. You know, if that food and isn't right and the proper recovery is not going in, and people also aren't eating enough food, the body's just going to try to hold on to whatever fat it has because a lot of times it thinks it's in this almost like a starvation mode because it's not getting enough fuel in. It's like, okay, I have to hold on to this fat because I don't know when I'm going to eat again. So I think somewhere where a lot of people mess up, and I know I struggled with this, is that some people just don't eat enough. So they can't even lose that fat. Yeah, and your stress hormone cortisol goes up when you're not when you're on a long term calorie restricted diet without any kind of breaks. But what about fasting and intermittent fasting and all of that rage about that? Is that tricking our metabolism into that same state of uh oh, hold on to everything? Yeah, I think it's interesting because I think it depends how someone's doing the intermittent fasting. Because I think intermittent fasting can be super beneficial, and I typically do it, you know, almost five days a week. But if someone's not eating enough within that time restricted window, they're going to still run into the same problem. And for some people, if they're used to eating, you know, every couple of hours, it's harder for them to fit the amount of uh, nutrition that they need in that time restricted window. So it's not to say that intermittent fasting can't work, but it's not going to work if there's not enough food going in. And for people who don't know, intermittent fasting is basically limiting your eating window to a period of most commonly eight hours and fasting for 16 hours to shift from burning off your carbs and your sugars overnight and after however long your fast is to shifting to burning fat. And they found in a lot of studies that the calorie restriction and time restricted eating actually work a little bit differently as far as weight loss and fat loss goes. Um, people who are calorie restricted have more weight loss, but less of it is fat. And people who intermittent fast have more um, have about the same weight loss, but more of it is fat and less of its muscle, if that makes sense. Um, which is really interesting. We'll have to dive into that later on another episode. But so you think that so how do you know how much to eat then if if your goal if that's your goal to gain muscle, build abs, lose fat, what do we do? Yeah, and that's why I think that part is interesting cuz we're all so individually unique that, you know, what works for me might not work for you, might not work for the next person. And that's why I think that self-awareness comes in and people need to kind of actively track and reassess what they're doing and see how it's working for them. 
I mean, one of my favorite strategies that I like to use for my clients is twofold. It's one, writing down what they're eating and how much and even taking pictures because a lot of times that's easier for them. But then also, instead of just stepping on a scale, it's having them consistently take pictures um, of their body, right? Making sure whether they're you know taking selfies in the mirror, just making sure that you know, they have the same distance from the mirror, the lighting's the same, what they're wearing's the same. It's at the same type of uh, the same time of the day. This way you can look at those pictures and you can see the consistency build up week after week after week after week to where you look at week eight versus week one, you can see a tangible difference in the body structure. Whereas sometimes people try to just step on the scale and they don't see the number going down. But that can just easily be because they're putting on more muscle and they're losing fat and that number might not change, but their physique is changing considerably. Yeah, pictures are definitely a great way to track progress and same with measurements versus just relying on the scale all the time. What about crunches versus planks? Do you really think those are are great for our core? Even though, like I know you said we have to work on eating, but how what is the best way to get abs given what you're doing in the gym so i think there is assuming everything else is going right if you are doing those you know dynamic flexion movements right so like crunches sit-ups twists things of that nature i mean that is going to work on the rectus abdominis which is you know our six-pack muscles ones that we think of when we think of uh, core movements right but when we really look at the core in general, the things like planks, side planks, farmer's carries, things of that nature, that's making our core stronger, but it may not necessarily show in um, our physique, per se. So there's a place for the crunches, right? Heavy-weighted crunches and things of that nature, but it's like a small puzzle piece that works with everything else. Yeah, and that kind of falls under the whole idea of spot training, where you can work a muscle and reach fatigue and have it, you know, recover and get stronger, but you, you know, you might not see it unless you're losing overall body fat. Right, exactly. And that's what such like such an interesting concept because I see clients and I used to think about this myself, it's like, okay, I'm gonna go here and I'm gonna keep hitting these side crunches so I lose my uh, love handles. But, you know, in actuality the way most people's bodies work is that we lose fat from the head down to the toe up. So naturally, it's always harder, um, and it's always the last place we really see the results are in our midsection because that's the last place you know it happens. But it seems like that's like the first place it goes when we're not eating and doing the right thing. So there's definitely frustration that lies in that. Absolutely. Now, what are some other mistakes that you do see at the gym? Maybe three mistakes or misconceptions that people have about working out. Yeah. So I would say the first one I see almost all the time it's just um inefficient breathing as they're doing the workout so typically whenever we do a movement when we are you know moving the weight or we're shortening the muscle so say in a push up we're on that bottom position we're pushing up and getting tall again you know that's when we should be exhaling and then we should be inhaling as that muscle is starting to lengthen again so a lot of times I see people just you know, holding their breath all throughout a workout or they're just huffing and puffing real fast and they don't have that rhythm and symmetry. And then they wonder why they get so tired or they feel like they're about to pass out or they're lightheaded. And it's all from just that inefficient breathing. So I think that's probably the biggest mistake I see. Number one. The second one I would say is for someone whose goal is to say it's just to tone up, right? So to put on muscle, to lose fat. I see a lot of people trying to adopt um, almost like a bodybuilding type of exercise routine where they're focusing just on one muscle a day, right? Five times or six times throughout the week. And that's just not very efficient for just the average person. Now, if you're a bodybuilder and you're focusing on that hypertrophy type training and you have two, two and a half hours to spend in a gym and you're being super meticulous with your food and you're measuring everything out and, you know, that's their full-time job. So they make time for that. Then I get it. But if the goal is to maximize overall, just how much, you know, fat you're burning, 
and how much muscle you're putting on, most people would benefit more from a, you know, full body type of workout style or, you know, some type of upper and lower body split where they're maximizing their compound movements and engaging more muscles at a time. And it kills two birds with one stone. It's more effective in terms of time management and being able to get in and out and still live, you know, our busy lifestyles that most of us have. And it's just going to allow you to burn fat at a more efficient rate. Yeah, definitely. I agree with that. And what about, let's say people want to start strength training, they want to start getting into the gym. How can they make, how would you structure a strength training workout and how would you make it a little bit more fun too? Right, right. So the first thing I do is, is, you know, I make sure we just focus on the fundamentals because if somebody's not moving properly without weight, if they add load or they add some type of external resistance, all they're going to do is put themselves at a higher chance for injury or they're just going to start to just get imbalances because they have bad moving patterns. So the first thing I do is I try to structure it that way. And to keep it fun, I try to find out what my clients like. So everyone's different. Everyone's personality is different. I almost try to approach working out like, you know, like adult playtime. Like we're there to have fun. And different people are engaged through different things. Some people like to try to make a game out of something, whether it's, you know, holding a, an isometric movement, meaning that, say, if it's a squat, they're just sitting in that squat position and they're just holding it as we're doing something else that's engaging. So it's nice for them because it's helping their body and their central nervous system understand what it feels like to be in the proper position. But then at the same time, I just give them little like external things to do so that they are having a little bit more fun, whether that's I'm throwing a tennis ball at them, they're catching it and, you know, they're challenging their hand eye coordination or anything like that can keep it more engaging. Yeah. And I think something for me that's been helpful in keeping myself interested is is changing up how long I'm holding something or the pace or um, the structure of the workout. So instead of doing every single time a circuit and repeating it four times through, you know, whatever it is, trying to change it up and maybe throwing in a Tabata, like a little cardio blast for four minutes where you're doing 20 seconds of work and 10 seconds of rest and repeating it eight times or I like the idea that you said about making it kind of a game for yourself somehow. <laughs> if you're by yourself, it might be hard to throw yourself a tennis ball while you're in a squat. But, you know, looking looking for ways to make it interesting and fun for you is key, I think, for people who want to keep coming back and have, have fun and enjoy the process. And you bring up a great point, too, when you talk about, like, t- Tabatas and things like that. Like, anything that's going to change the tempo of what you're doing is going to throw the body uh, for a loop, right? So anytime you have some type of um, what the scientific term is, or scientific term is, is a progressive overload. And that's just meaning you're trying to change and add to the stimulus so that the body doesn't get used to what we've been doing um, the whole time before that. So another mistake that I see is a lot of people are just always sticking to the same routine all the time. And even if they're not bored of it, in a sense, their body's bored and their body's not going to keep adapting. And sometimes people get stuck on, you know, the amount of weight that they're moving, thinking the only way they can progress is by adding more weight. But you can add more weight, you can add more reps, you can add more sets. Um, You can do the same workout in a shorter amount of time, which would be density training, which is really effective. So just understanding that there's more than one way to uh, to approach a workout session, you know, can go a long way in progressing somebody. What about when it comes to working out? Can you build muscle on other types of programs other than strength training? Is it anything that just fatigues your muscles? What's more effective? Tell me a little bit about my options. If I'm a new person and I want to start going to the gym, a lot of people think there's only one thing they can do, whether it's the Zumba class or only strength training or weightlifting. Tell, tell me about my options and what's the most efficient, the benefits of each one. Right, right. And then are we asking just in terms of what, what's the goal? I- the goal would be to uh, build muscle in this situation and then in general lose, lose fat if we can combine those. Okay, right, right. So typically you, you hear people talk about hypertrophy training being like the quote-unquote best uh, training method for putting on size. And usually 
high pressure retraining are sets that are just longer in duration, right? So say one working set, say it takes me two seconds to lower the weight and a second to raise it, right? So that's like a three second rep. You know, if I want to do something for closer to say 60 seconds, that's to give that body the response like, okay, I need to grow bigger, right? That's kind of the message that goes there, which is different from strength training where we can train to and get a lot stronger, but not necessarily grow bigger. So kind of finding the combination, I think, is key. And that's where like, you know, variable training comes in, which means like, you know, maybe trying to take one day where you're focusing mostly on strength. And then you might do another type of training session where the weight is lighter and you're doing more reps so that you can build hypertrophy. But then also slipping in some type of, say, high intensity interval training, like with the Tabata sets or by going outside and running sprints or doing things of that nature, which is going to help the body over time burn more fat effectively. So I think having an integrative approach where you're taking parts of each one and making it more variable has the most success overall. Awesome. I love that. And what about steady state cardio, like going for a run, uh, long, long endurance training? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that also goes back into the goal. If someone's uh, goal is to jog better, then go jogging, right? That's definitely going to help you out. And it's really good for, say, the uh, the aerobic system, like aerobic training, which is pretty much anything over 60 seconds. So you're you're building up your heart capacity. But if somebody's goal is to lose fat and they're only doing that, they're not going to get as much benefit you know, off of that. Like you look at like a cross country runner and you look at their physique, typically they're very slender. They don't have a lot of fat, but they don't have a lot of muscle either. As opposed to say a sprinter, you watch some of these guys and girls, they're much more lean. They have muscle mass, good definition. But um, that's not to say one is right and one is wrong. It just more depends on the outcome. So I would think with steady state cardio, I think it's good to add that in maybe, you know, once a week. But to have that be the only thing somebody does, you know, I don't think that's very beneficial. It was the same way with like weightlifting. If someone's only lifting heavy weight or doing high intensity workouts, you know, six days a week, that's not going to be beneficial for the body either. So really focusing on balance and maybe shifting it slightly towards whatever your specific goal is and do maybe one or two more of those things is going to be better than kind of just prescribing to just one specific thing and only doing that all the time. All righty. We will get to part two of this interview with Danny Thompson next week. Until then, if you want to check them out, check out youcan2fit.com. And that is the number two in you can to fit. All right. Thanks for listening.